Welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Kidder. Our podcast is all about issues facing Southern Utah. Here, we will announce your upcoming events, talk with movers and shakers in our community about important issues facing Beaver, Iron, Kane, and Washington counties, and make sure that you are kept in the loop with interesting news and commentary of local interest. While we welcome folks from all over, our goal with this podcast is to give residents of Southern Utah a place to find out about issues that affect them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and also on our Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, and online at What's Really Happening SU.com. Hey, welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast, and this is in conjunction with Cedar City Politics. My name's Dan Kidder, and I'm your host. Today I am joined in the studio by County Commission, Iron County Commission candidate for seat C, Ken Robinson. And Ken has been a longtime resident of Iron County, and he's going to introduce himself and let us know a little bit about him and why he wants to be on the County Commission. Ken, how are you doing? Doing really good. Thanks, Dan, for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm a longtime Iron County resident. I moved here in 1987 to attend SUSC uh, and just really love the area. Um, from the time I was a child, I loved coming to Cedar City to visit here. I uh, came here to visit family. I also came here to compete in different competitions at SUSC. And uh, just really loved the area. And so I decided to come to SUSC um, and, and make my home here. That's the former <coughs> name for SUU. Correct. Yeah. What Correct. kind of competitions did you engage in? Uh, in... in in some athletic, in speech, and debate, and those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, just very varied. Anything I could do to get on the bus and get out of town where I grew up. And so where did you grow up? I grew up in Monticello, Utah, on the southeastern side of the state. So you're still a Utah boy for, yeah. from long back. <clears throat> so I, I grew up in Monticello on a cattle ranch there. Uh, we still have our, our family still has a ranch there, and I'm involved in that. Um, but. My, my home has been here since 1987. Okay. Now, you're a longtime agriculture guy. Correct. Uh, you were the manager of uh, IFA for so, a long time. Yep. So upon graduating from SUU, uh, I, I took a job temporarily out at uh, Circle 4 Hog Farm until the job as the, as, as the assistant manager opened up at IFA. So I began working at IFA. Uh, Right when I got married, um, worked as the warehouse guy there while I was going through school, um, put myself through school, took me longer than most because I refused to get a student loan. I, I did not want to be burdened by that debt. I wanted to be self-reliant and, and put myself through school. So I, it, it took my wife and myself a little bit longer than, than the four years that is the prototypical, right? So. After graduating, I took a job out at Circle Four, and then the assistant manager position opened it up at Intermountain Farmers. And back then, Intermountain Farmers was located next to Coal Creek. Yeah. <clears throat> we had the feed mill, we had the retail, and we had the the agronomy center. So we had we had all three operations right there, lo operating out of that small facility. Yeah, and I it, think it's a plumbing supply or something. It's Mountain Land Supply now. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I was a manager there um, overall for 22 years uh, but during during my career there um, the first thing that that kind of really changed what what we did there is they is Intermountain Farmers opened up the feed mill just south of Nephi and Levan and so we were able to transition that portion of our business up to there and they do a whole lot better job than we ever could in our antiquated facility here. All I did was spend money on maintenance and, and repairs. Sure. And, and, you know, it was, it, we were just chasing money after what we couldn't really achieve. You and that's know? the thing I, I don't think a lot of people understand <coughs> about the agriculture business. I, I recently did a series for um, the, the Farm Bureau. And I got a kind of eye-opening. It's a business. It's oh, yeah. not just going out there and digging dirt and feeding animals and no, slopping no, hogs. No, 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 no. And it, it is a business, and there yeah. is a lot of those business aspects to that and the financial management of that business. And, right. And I don't think a lot of people see that side of it. Right. And so, you know, it, it was very frustrating as the manager of that operation to see how much money we were putting into repairs and, 
and trying to maintain to maintain that facility where it was old and antiquated and just falling apart and we couldn't produce a good product to deliver to the customers that I felt comfortable with that I felt confident in being being able to go to the customer and saying hey this is a top-notch quality product right and so when they opened that facility I was more than willing to to relinquish that part of my business and send it to send it to somebody else Sometimes you got to do what you know you're good at right right and and, and that's kind of where we work too um, and so the next step in that process was uh, Albertsons decided to close the grocery store here in the south end of town and that facility became available and it was a much better location for the retail operation of what is what everybody knows now as IFA and so we were able to move the retail location up there and I stayed with the agronomy which is ag chemicals fertilizer right <clears throat> and so we were able to concentrate uh, uh, more on that business and, and be able to expand that business. My entire vision the whole time that this was going on was to build a, a nice big facility which we eventually ended up building that's down towards the airport now on the back side of the rail tracks from the from the coke plant. Okay. Now your, so, your uh, agricultural bona fides include a little bit more. Everybody knows the name Robinson when it comes to one vegetable. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess it, to kind of frame that, I guess, I don't have any famous relatives, <laughs> per se. Um, I don't have any Robinson relatives in Iron County either. either. A lot of people will try to say, well, you're, are you related to so-and-so and, and different people, you know, and I'm, I'm not. I, yeah. I have, outside of my wife and my kids, I have one nephew that lives here, and he's not even, a, his last name's not Robinson, so... You know, a lot of people <clears throat> recognize me from years and years of interaction and and think I'm a, a homebred or, you know, yeah. but I, I'm not. Well, you've been here for quite a I've while. Been here for a long time. And it, it, for <clears throat> those who are wondering what I'm talking about, the Robinson family pumpkin patch. No. Oh, okay. Every fall, <laughs> uh, you, you see them out there. Yeah. I don't know if you ever remember so, somebody leaving you a bunch of ammo on your tractor seat. Did you ever find No them? kidding. That was me. I, no I, kidding. I, yeah, I'd come by and was doing a video for Sportsman's Warehouse, and we were going to test out some ammo. Yeah. And we wanted to shoot some pumpkins, and you said, just go help yourself. And Oh, yeah. You know, if you got any I, ammo left I, over. I do remember that. Uh, just, just you know, bring on by any leftover ammo. So when we came back, we left you some ammo on your tractor <laughs> seat. I always wondered if you got <laughs> it or somebody yeah, else No, got that's it. pretty good. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesome. So, so tell me why it is that you you decided to put your you throw your literal hat in the ring uh, for this county commission seat. Now, for those who are not aware, Marilyn Wood is currently serving as county commissioner for seat C, and she is not running for re-election this year. And Correct. I'm sad to see that because I love the heck out of Marilyn and Matt. And fantastic, people. great people, and she did a fantastic job. Uh, on the county commission, even having to tackle some of the, the unpopular right. topics. And we're going to talk a little bit about those in a minute. But tell me what it was that made you decide you wanted to be a county commissioner. So I, th I actually thought about it years ago, um, just, just the need to be involved. Um, and then I found out that Maryland was going to run, and I said, okay, if, as long as there's somebody that's going to represent agriculture in the county commission, then I'm comfortable with that. Right. Somebody that's knowledgeable about it, somebody that has the background experience, and skin in the game, right? And so that's, that's why I didn't run when Maryland decided to run. And then I, I kept thinking about it, thinking about it, and I would ask her or Matt pointed questions that they probably at the time didn't realize why I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I heard through the grapevine that she was possibly thinking about not running. And so I, I, asked, I asked her and Matt one day if, if uh, she was going to run and, and that I had thought about it in the past. So anyways, the reason I, that I, I wanted to do this, um, I just, I've been taken in by Aaron County by Cedar City since I moved here, um, absolutely have been taken care of by the county and the, the residents in here in Iron County. And so I've always wanted to give back and wanted to be involved and, and look for opportunities to help out where I can. Um, and my career prepared me for this mm -hmm. in that I've managed people, I've managed rolling stock, 
I've I've been involved with the agriculture community countywide. I've I've covered I, I won't say all of the county in my experience, but I've covered most of the Iron County in my experience, and and I've I've got good relationships with people in in all, if not most, parts of the county. Well, and I think that agricultural aspect of the county commission is super important. I mean, Mike's a cop. Right. Paul's a cabinet maker. Um, neither one of them really have much, you know, dirt under their fingernails, so to say, when it comes to agriculture. But agriculture is still a big part of Iron County. You get out of Cedar City and, and out into the countryside, and right. it's still a huge part between sheep farming and, and alfalfa production. And even the other side of that, you've got mining, natural resources. Right. Um, so those are still big aspects of what goes on in Iron County and a big source of the revenue that the county Correct. has to operate with. Correct. When it comes to revenue, uh, one of the biggest issues that we've been looking at is we haven't had a tax increase in the county in 24 years. We've had some pretty good fiscally responsible county commissioners going back decades. Um, and we recently had to look at doing a tax increase for the first time in that 24 years because we have the oldest jail in the entire state of Utah and it is in desperate need of, of replacement. Correct. And to the point where we may be forced to replace it by court order if, if we don't do it. And it was a very unpopular decision by all three county commissioners unanimously to look at a tax increase or a geo bond to replace that jail. Um, but there's been some news on that front. And that doesn't look like that's going to have to be the case anymore. It looks like we now, because of Rex Schiff's, uh, Schiff's efforts, in the state legislature can do a uh, consumption tax Correct. on everybody, but you know, also passing that on to visitors who are many times guests of our jail. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about that and where we are on that and what your take on that is. So I, I'm, I'm excited to see that that is the approach that's gonna be taken. Um, because exactly what you said, it's not going to be burdened solely on the the homeowners or the landowners in Iron County. Mm -hmm. We're gonna share that with everybody that's coming through, through the county and stop share, through you know, all, all the services that we provide in the county, all the traffic that's up and down I-15. Um, they're gonna have a share in that with us and, and, and be able to help us out on that because exactly what you said, the Highway Patrol's pulling people in off I-15 and, and all of a sudden that becomes a county burden. Yeah. And so it's great that the, 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 that traffic will now be participating in regulating, or I shouldn't say regulating, but in helping out the burden of the Iron County with that, with that tax. Yeah, that's, that's, we're looking at about a $100 million project to, right. to get that jail on, online. And, right. and it's, it's definitely neat. I've been in the, uh, the old jail or the current jail, right. and it's, it's definitely in bad shape. Um, and, and we're lucky we have, you know, as I said, a lot of uh, fiscally conservative values that have been displayed for decades to, to keep taxes relatively low. Um, and one of the biggest things that has moved toward that is being a county commissioner is a full-time job. We don't have, uh, you know, a county manager or supervisor that you right. know, sees, oversees the departments. Each county commissioner has different departments that they oversee Correct. and that becomes a full-time job in management and it's it's not just an elected office where you you know meet once a, a <laughs> month or twice a month and and have a meeting you're overseeing these departments are you going to have the time to be that full-time county commissioner i i do i have a very flexible career right now with the job that i have um and the departments that uh county cc are the oversee are the the landfill the road department the fair the fairgrounds um, entities or departments that i'm very very familiar with through my career and through my upbringing mm -hmm. and so those are those are um, areas that i'm very comfortable with i wouldn't want to run for the county seat to be over the sheriff's department i have no experience <laughs> with the sheriff's department mike does a great job our sheriff is fantastic but that's just not my expertise. And so County CC is really where I feel comfortable and it's where I feel that my past experience is the most valuable to the residents of Iron County. 
Is that that why you didn't throw your hat in the ring on that last uh, yeah. fiasco there? That <coughs> yeah. We had uh, two county commissioners up, and we had lots and lots of money flowing in. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> and speaking of lots and lots of money, um, the you know there, there's a mine operation here that is uh, owes the the county anywhere between uh, I think it's seven to nine million dollars in back taxes that are unpaid, and. Uh, the, the owner of that company has is, is put a lot of money into the last candidate and the, your current opponent uh, to uh, try to influence this election. Um, th those are some pretty deep pockets. How are you going to combat that kind of uh, attack on your uh, campaign? Um, right now I'm self-funded, but I'm, I'm beginning to, to, to raise more money to, to combat that. Um, you know the the owner of that mine I have a relationship with. I've I've worked with him through my position at IFA for many many years. Um, but you know hopefully we can keep, we can work through that and 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 put up a good front and make a good campaign and and hopefully the people of Iron County will see the value in in what I bring to the table. It's a weird system the way that that whole tax thing came about. This is a, this is really the fault of the state legislature, and, and what they said was that you know a county regulates the taxes on the businesses and the, and the homes within that county unless they're a certain size business. Then the state wants to set the tax rate. <laughs> <laughs> There's this more in little, the pot; they want yeah, part of it. Seems a little hinky to me. I don't know. <laughs> Some of the things that come out of Salt Lake City, I just wonder what's going on in their minds up there, but. I, I'm sure they have their own motivations for that type right. of thing. So there's been some litigation on that that's been ongoing for quite some time, and it's getting pretty costly for the county to continue to to fight that litigation. And, right. uh, and a lot of money is getting tossed around, and um, you know our coffers are not huge. How many how many employees does the county have right now? Do you have any idea on that? I I, I know the sheriff's department is the largest. Uh, the road department is the second largest, if I'm correct in that. I would guess it's probably close to two to three hundred, two hundred and fifty to three hundred. Yeah, I think uh, there's like two hundred in the sheriff's department. Okay. But not just the officers, but you know everything. Everything involved, yeah. so probably higher than that. Quite so a bit probably around five, five hundred, something like that. We'll have to check on that and find out. House and all. I'd never thought of that question until just now. I've had county commissioners yeah. in here, the sheriff in here, and I've never thought of that question until just now. Yeah. Um, what are some of the goals that you want to achieve if you get elected to the county commission? So one of the most important things to me, um, as I look at Iron County and the surrounding area, is our public lands. Um, there's huge attacks right now on our public lands and mm -hmm. access to those public lands by entities that don't have anything to do with, with with the western United States, let alone Utah, let alone Iron County. Mainly on the federal level. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, and so there's, you know, there's attacks on, on access to our private ground. Um, just recently there was a, in the Securities Exchange, Securities Exchange Commission, they tried to get in what they call the natural asset companies and to get that publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And what that would do was it would it would provide an opportunity for conglomerates or large money entities to, to put together money to purchase these natural asset companies, which then would be able to come in and bid or take over parts of, pri or of public lands in the West. You mean mainly mining and, and oil exploration, natural gas exploration, those or types of companies? Or anything involved with those public lands. Wow. So uh, ranching cattle? So, yeah. So, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've thought about and tried to address this is everybody wants public land access, right? Mm -hmm. which, which entity is the most important? Is it mining? Is it forestry? Is it grazing? Is it, is it dirt bike riding? Is it ATV access? Is it hiking? Well, in a state where 75% or 70% of the, the land is owned by the federal government, it seems like there's enough land for everybody to be able right. to, <laughs> to coexist and operate together. Right. But all those are equally important because as soon as, soon as they pick off one and say, well, that's, that's not important anymore, well, then the next domino is up for, up for grabs, yeah. right? So all of those entities, the sportsmen, I, did, I excluded the sportsmen, and that's a huge part of it. 
<clears throat> the sportsmen, the hunters, they need to be involved with the cattlemen. They need to be involved with the ATV. They need to be involved. We all need to be involved because we're not we're not fronting this together. Yeah. And so there's these pressures that are coming that are trying to pluck us off one by one and eliminate use or access to these public grounds. Well, and that's been BLM's MO for years, is that divide and conquer. It's yeah, the, exactly it's the right. mountain bikers against the hunters. It's exactly the, yeah. right. And it really isn't. It, it no. really is about access. I remember when the right. Bears Ears National Monument land grab occurred and, and Trump was talking about rolling that back. Uh, there were guys like, uh, you know, the, the founders of, of North Face and, and uh, Patagonia, Patagonia got got super involved in and they that. were saying the president's trying to steal your land it sounds to me like he's trying to give it back right because you're limiting access and, and he's trying to, right. to restore that access and right. the other thing I saw during that was you know these people were saying well if Trump's doing this then now we're gonna have oil wells all over the place and mines all over the place well, for 125 years, it was not there's a monument, access. and there's not oil. Well, if there was oil there, there'd probably be, but there's not. <laughs> right. You know, so the, the rhetoric gets pretty pretty thick sometimes. Right, I think, and, there, and the, there's a huge misunderstanding in the marketing of that, and, yeah. and, and certain entities choose exactly like you said to say that he's going to take away their public grounds. Yeah, and, and in reality, that should be. That that power should be closer to where we are. Instead, yeah, it's just a matter of Washington. who's managing it, right? Correct. Some bureaucrat in Washington D.C., some closet swamp dweller, or somebody local, your neighbor, your friends. Right. You know, some commission like the hunting. You know, DWR has has a commission of hunters that make the the, the laws for hunting and the right rules and regulations. And right, you know, so uh, another big issue that we see in Iron County all the time we're talking about is water. Are we going to have enough water? And what can be done to ensure that they, we have enough water resources for the, the huge growth that we're seeing in this county? Right. <clears throat> so the reality of that is we live in the high mountain desert. <laughs> we are limited on water. It's, it, you know, there's obviously a, there, there's a limit there. Um, and I've spent time with the state engineer's office. I spent time with the district office here in Iron County and trying to get a better understanding of that. Um, but the bottom of the story is water rights were over allocated and that's that's the end of the story water rights have been over allocated. well the end of the story is that the state's revoking <laughs> some of those and so and so, yeah. and so now to to try to remedy that situation they've gone in and said hey we're going to start to revoke some of those junior water rights and that creates a whole conundrum of problems right because anybody that bought a junior water right bought that on good faith yeah anybody that sold that junior water right sold that on good faith that there was that water available and so that puts both the seller and the buyer in a in a bad situation so there's a lot to work through there um, there's been a lot of work done to bring to bring water from other valleys um, and the county has filed on those water rights and, and the court has adjudicated those water rights to Iron County. And that's a project that'll take several years to, to, uh, to accomplish. But in the meantime, what we can do is, is manage our water better. And there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of progress towards that um, through irrigation systems, um, through pivot irrigation, um, and, and then not only just the advancements of pivot irrigation, but also through the advancement in the nozzle pa packages that go on those, on those um, pivots. Well, and there's been a lot of recapture and recharge. Uh, those those, the have, been, those well. have been really good, those have been really good uh, projects that have, that have taken place to, to try to recharge that, to try to recharge our our um, aquifer because all the water right rights now, in the world don't mean a thing if there's if the not the water not there. there just because you have a right to the water it doesn't correct. If it's not there you don't have any correct we're, we're about a seven thousand acre foot deficit right now of our of what we're depleting from the system right now yeah. versus what the recharge is and so we've got so, water <clears> rights <throat> now up in the beaver range but that's going to require some sort of a pipeline yep uh, we've got the pine valley uh, water rights, and that's going to require that's, a very expensive pipeline. It's a big project, and it's a it's a lot of money. But 
our growth is not slowing down. Yeah. And so we've got to we've got to try to get in front of that and try to manage that so that we do have that water. Well, with that growth comes additional revenue to su to support those projects. But it also comes with additional use. Correct. A lot more additional use. Correct. So how about a immigrant tax on anybody moving to Utah? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I've had some ideas thrown at me like that. You know, hey, they're the ones coming. They need to pay for all of it. Right. Four thousand uh, dollars of impact your assessed fee, value impact fee. Impact or, fee yeah. to move here, and yeah. So there's, you know, there's some, there's some interesting ideas that I've had thrown at me. But the reality of it is, it's a huge, it's a huge block that's in front of us, and we've got to work through it, and we've got to be yeah. able to manage that, and and figure out how to do that and kind of like the jail issue i think that anything that the county commission has to do is not going to be popular with everybody right um, and it's it's kind of a county commissioner's job to look at the big picture and what has to be done even if it's not popular i think that's how we got to the jail point is you know previous county commissions didn't want to <laughs> touch right. that third rail and right right and so and so the now the, a, a story that I've heard, and I've not verified it, but the the county, the existing county facility, was mandated by a federal judge, yeah. because yeah. Iron County had been slow to progress and 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 build a new facility. And that was back in '87, I think. '87. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so we're on the brink of that right now. We're we're on the brink of of being forced to do that right now. Well, and these lawsuits that prisoners are filing for civil rights violations and everything else they can get into the hundreds of millions of dollars everybody right. talked about joe arpaio's tent cities right. but he cost maricopa county over 200 million dollars in lawsuits, lawsuits. <laughs> so yeah. you know that's the other side of that coin is is not a popular <laughs> right. thing to have to look at right um and, and the other thing that i think people need to be aware of is employees of the county have a right to expect a decent wage that they can you know afford to live here that's exactly and we can't right. employ people that can't afford to live here and that's not just employees of the county but that's something within the control of the county commission recently we had to, to give those employees a raise, a raise and yeah. there were some people that wasn't popular with um, but they wouldn't want to have to be living far underneath the, the wages under a competitive rate of yeah. uh, for the same job that they're doing in 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 the open market correct yeah. I mean the sheriff was telling me he couldn't he couldn't keep people Right. He was operating at a 25 uh, deputy deficit for a while there because they'd get him trained and spend all that money to get him trained, and then and, they would go off to another municipality. And, and then, and, and that's an unseen cost. Yeah. is that training? Oh yeah. You know, I'd, I'd, my background had, with with employees, if I had a key employee quit that had years of experience and had that knowledge of of the job to do, where I needed him to go, what I needed him to do. I had to ensure that he was doing the job correctly, mm -hmm. and if the job was done incorrectly, then I would have a claim against against my business, right? And so that that value that you have in a trained employee is is it it's so valuable. <laughs> That's yeah. not a great way to say that, right? That's terrible. well, the, no. There's there's a but lot of expense that goes. There's into a lot of expense that goes somebody. into training employees. And, and maintaining the those employees. Especially when you look at something like the highways. I mean, we have highways that, right. I can't remember, what is it 36,000 square miles of, of county or something? <laughs> it's, <a lot. laughs> it's, it's huge. It's a lot. It goes all the way out to the Nevada border, and it, right. you know, there's roads out there. And, and a lot of people don't think, when they think the county, they think Parowan, Enoch, maybe Newcastle, Burl. There's um, miles and miles and miles of road that they have to maintain yeah. and those employees that know those roads and are trained to know those roads and have years of experience to, to maintain those roads are extremely valuable. Yeah. Because it's, if you were to lose one of those employees to a more competitive wage, then you would have to spend so much more money training the new guy. And there's a lot of equipment that goes and the equipment, along with the that that the county of the, belongs. The maintenance of that equipment and the the running of that equipment, you know, it, it just it just compounds over. They just had a, a ribbon cutting for a new uh, compactor out of, the, <laughs> out of right. the landfill. I'd never seen a piece of rolling stock get its yeah. own ribbon cutting, get but, it. I, you know, I thought that was pretty neat. But it's, yeah, yeah. you've got to know when it's, it's more prudent to buy new versus right. trying to keep cobbling something together with chewing <laughs> gum and duct tape and bailing wire and yeah i i i would echo that i i would much rather in my personal life would much rather make a payment on a new 
piece of equipment versus maintenance because you're broke down and you're out of yeah. service you can't get to the, the reason you have pay. that piece of equipment you can't do correct no correct and so going back to my experience at IFA you know for years and years and years we struggled along and struggled and struggled and struggled to have good equipment and we were broke down well the jobs didn't go away yeah just the farmer got madder because we weren't there to take care of that job that needed to be done right yeah. And so it's so valuable to have the right piece of equipment, to have the right person in that piece of equipment to do that job that it's, it's, it's great to see when it comes together. It's a great dichotomy, right? We, we want everything to run smoothly. We want the roads maintained. We want the infrastructure kept up, but right. we don't want to pay for it. Right. And I hate taxes as much as anybody, but I understand right. sometimes you have to pay for the things that you've the, got to do. That you've got to do to maintain that. You will never, ever make everybody happy in that regard. No. <laughs> so, no. No. yeah, God bless you. I, no, 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 nobody sees the value of it until their road's all washboardy, and then all yeah. of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, that new piece of equipment, they just took care of that road, it's pretty slick. Now, now there is a, a guy that knows how to do it is even better, right? <laughs> there is a county issue that's probably in my mind the most number one county issue and that is when y'all gonna get the road out to the shooting range <laughs> fully paved, get it paved all that's, the there. that's mine I, yeah. I think the, the solar want, company paved it to that point and then you worry yeah. about your optics as you go over the yeah, absolutely and, yeah my lenses are rattling <laughs> loose and i'm getting my zero out and no i mean yeah. i would love to see that i understand yeah. the cost involved with that and getting somebody else to pay for it whenever you can that's a great thing so yeah um, and, and that's been one thing I've noticed in Utah in general, and especially in Cedar City politics, when you look at, you know, things that are needed, typically it's the new developments coming in, they make pay for that. You're going to pay for the streets, right. you're going to pay for the fire hydrants, you're going to pay for park, you're going to pay, you know, and right. I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps yeah. that burden off the taxpayer. Correct. Yeah, so. and that new infrastructure needs to be to where it can pay for those, the to sustain itself. And we're seeing growth, not just in the cities, but out in the county all itself. Over. It's all over, yeah. It's I, I look back at when I first would drive through the county here in 91 when I started with, with IFA versus what it is now, and it, it makes me want to throw up in my mouth. <laughs> the, the farm ground's disappearing, and it, it, it's, it's hard to see. Yeah, those, those families, the farming families pass on, and the, they pass the property on to their kids, yeah. and they don't necessarily want to keep that it, lifestyle it, it's it's split yeah it get, you know how do you how do you divide that pie and so it becomes a difficult conversation in reality yeah. it, it, re it really does it becomes a conversation of well i can i can sell this property to to a developer and pass on wealth to my children or they can split it up and i'll be poor yeah so how you know how do you manage that and it's getting harder for farmers in general just to compete against the corporate farm machines that are out there individual farmers are are struggling like crazy it's, and we're seeing highly that in the cost of food and it's highly highly competitive yeah and i understand that a lot of the alfalfa being grown here in, in our valley is heading to china it's not even for local use in in years past this year the the foreign market is very depressed mm -hmm. um and so there's there's not that uh, that demand for it right now to a foreign market there's still there's still good markets in korea and japan um, there's still a lot of alfalfa hay that leaves the county and goes to Korea and Japan. You know, a lot of people don't pay attention to what's going up and down I-15. There's all these all these van trailers that are leaving Long Beach Port and going to the Wasatch Front to deliver goods of everything imaginable up to the Wasatch Front and to, and to Iron County also. Then those trucks turn around to go to about, go back to Long Beach to get their next load and they're empty. Yeah. And so it becomes an, it, it becomes a very economical or cheap freight rate for growers or brokers here in Iron County to reload that with hay that goes to Long Beach and they well, That's get, good because we want to be exporting as much as we're importing and, and if we're <coughs> just having that import deficit. Yeah, yeah it's good to see those yeah, trucks so, going back full. You know, it, it, it's kind of funny the conversation went to here because when I went to I went to SUU and I got my I got my degree in languages and in marketing. Mm -hmm. And NAFTA was the big deal, right? Oh yeah. And I just served a Me I just served a mission in Mexico, and so Spanish was it was an easy degree for me to get. Marketing and international trade was kind of kind of where I focused my education. 
And at the time that I graduated and started working for IFA, it's like, okay, I'm not using my degree, right? But as, as time has progressed, and we see this foreign market expand and, and how things have, have moved in, these growers in this area absolutely are participating in a global market. Yeah. And they're very impacted by that global market. I mean, right now the, the hay price has dropped almost 50% right. from what it was a year and a half ago or a year ago. Then we see that when the global price on iron goes down, the mines right. have to lay people off. Oil prices, you're hiring and firing yeah. of people on the oil rigs. and Yeah, everything that, all our prices are influenced by a global market. Yeah, and understanding that economic situation is going to be a big yeah. part of being a county commissioner yeah. and how that interplay is there between our, our world marketplace, our national marketplace, our local marketplace. It's not all just selling to your neighbor. Yep. Um, you're you're right. selling on a global stage. Yeah, and, that's exactly and buying right. on a global and, stage. And, and buying on a global stage. You know, you look at the inputs that uh, that a alfalfa grower will have here in Iron County. Well, they're they're buying products that are sourced all over the world. Yeah. Li literally all over the world. And so, it you know, it's very much a global market. And I think the impact for that is felt the strongest in the housing market cost of housing has just skyrocketed and uh, Iron County and Washington County especially are, are yeah. some of the fastest growing in the country right. um, and, and having people be able to afford to stay here who grew up here and have lived here their whole lives their kids are you know getting yeah. older and moving out and um, what are some options that would be on the table to help with that housing cost you know I'm, I'm faced with that right now I have kids that, that want to stay here that wanted to to want to build a home here and, and get a job here and stay and it, it, it's extremely difficult mm -hmm. there's so much pressure from outside markets that are raising that price um, that it, it, it just becomes very very difficult there there was a story on one of the news channels the other night that there's been a a program put forth by the governor that will give a break to those first house buyers and hopefully help them out but I don't think there's enough of that to meet the demand yeah the demand is is so high when somebody in a city someplace else can sell the house they bought for five thousand dollars you know 45 years ago for millions of dollars and then come, come here, here and pay cash it's really hard to compete with that uh, Tyler Melling with the City Council put together a smaller lot size proposal for the city that I thought was pretty clever that you know it was completely a voluntary system nobody was mandated to do anything but it right. allowed them to build on a smaller lot size within the zoning ordinance and I thought that was a pretty clever way to, to try to work around that yeah you know, <coughs> you're not buying more land than you need you don't need to build a bigger house than you need and right. um, you know people like you if the kids are getting older and moving out and you don't need as much house maybe now that becomes an attractive option to you yeah what would the what would you be able to do on the county level do you think to help make that housing more affordable to keep people here i mean the other the, the other side of having people not afford to be able to live here is we don't have people afford to work here right and we, you, you know, know that, that that's a sad commentary that we're exporting our most valuable crop you could say yeah. is is our own kids so that's that's really tough um, you know, there, there's got there's got to be some programs that we can look at to to make that feasible to to maintain that to maintain our our own children in in the community. They want to be productive members of the community. They want yeah. they want to participate in everything that's going on. And so, you know, there's got there's got to be a workaround for. Those but when wages things. aren't keeping up with housing costs, it's we're some of the highest in the country right, right. now for housing costs. Right, and, and that's that's so that's so hard to address. You know, I, I look at my, I can tell you my experience, right? Mm -hmm. I built my own house. I was my own contractor. I, I did that so that I would have that sweat equity to, to, to get into it and, and, and be able to afford my home. And, but that's becoming more and more difficult Yeah. For, for everybody. Well, that skills gap is there too. I mean, we told right. every kid to go to college and you know, they needed right. to get a four year degree and, and now and, we're, and we're- Come out with what? what marketable skill yeah yeah but there, we're, we're in need of plumbers we're in need of electricians yeah. and I, I i think i was i know at least in cedar city i don't know if it's countywide but when you look at it 
70 to 80 percent of the people who work in this county or in the city are tied to construction in some way, even if they're selling, you know, doing title insurance or, right. or you know, seventy percent. Some somewhere in there, wow. yeah. Electricians, plumbers, developers, architects, wow. insurance. You know, it's all somehow tied in. And so people come in and say, "Well, let's just put a moratorium on all new construction." First of all, it's illegal; <laughs> you can't do that. But the second of all, it, it would destroy the economy, the economy because of so many people being somehow tied into. Uh, yeah. that market and so I don't know that that's a, a logical way to <laughs> yeah. approach you know that a thought that I had is it's so valuable to have Southwest Tech here close to the high schools yeah. and and allow allow these kids that are going to Cedar High or Canyon View High that want to pursue something like that you know there's I'm there's so many employers in the county that are looking for somebody that they could come on as an apprentice and, and yeah. be able to, to be able to work in the programs like that and you know i told you i graduated from suu and i was i was schooled through that mold right yep i mean i graduated and and i had a degree but i wanted to work in agriculture I, and so you know there i think we're trying to squeeze so many kids through this mold of a four-year degree and it's just not just not the way it should be done. I do love how active, though, the FFA and, and 4-H are in the schools here. And, um, it, it, you know, keeping that heritage. Those are, those are key programs part. that need to be, um, they need to be expanded and, and seen in a better light. Yeah. And, you know, so your so, area, if you get elected, would be the Iron County Fair. Correct. And... You know, everybody thinks of the fair. If they're if they're not in the agricultural community, the fair is a place to go ride rides and eat popcorn and right. and and that kind of thing. But that's not really the purpose of that entity. That's not why it exists. Tell us a little bit about what the the fair brings. And I this was this was a wake up call for me because <laughs> I did these interviews um, for the Farm Bureau there, and I didn't know most of what I, I was learning there. So tell us a little bit about. So that have background. you ever seen the ad for the L.A. County Fair? No. It is fantastic. There's there's a there's a mom and a couple of teenage daughters that are shopping and and they're looking at a sweater and she says this one's made out of cashmere right like like from from animals and they they go through this whole really really awkward conversation of with the tusks and she's making horns and <laughs> it, it's fantastic to to try to show the huge gap that exists between the agriculture community and and urban life right and most of the people who are in urban life are benefactors of that agriculture community whether they know it or not whether the, whether they realize it whether they appreciate it or not they are absolutely benefactors of the agriculture community and so the ver the fair is an opportunity to display that agriculture community um and they're they're putting in there's just recently approved to, to put in a new building to to be able to show livestock at the county fair um you know, most recently, everything's gone on down here at Diamond Z Arena, yeah. which is a phenomenal facility. It really is. It's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have that in in our in our county and support the Southwest Junior Livestock Show down there. But we've been lacking for a display barn at the at the county fair, and so along with you know everybody can bring in their wares of whatever the whatever it is that they're producing and show off at the fair and compete for a prize at the fair but to have the rodeo there and to have the uh, have the display barn there to show what these animals really are and how important they are and all the all the products and byproducts that come from an animal or from the agriculture community are so valuable yeah and, and you know it, you, you see a lot of clips or videos of, of people wanting to get rid of certain things in, right. in, in, in their... I'm going to come in, I'm going to build my house next to a dairy farm, and then I'm going to complain about the stink. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and, and everybody wants to move out into the country and live in the country until it's... Yeah, until that, they step in a pile of horse. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting conversation to have yeah. um, a lot, and, and, and try to open people's eyes as to what's what's really going on 
I think on, that's on a, the farm. that's people something people moving into this area need to understand is you are moving into a rural community, and, and there there's rural heritage here, yeah, and that's one of the big things I'm running on. You know, we are an agriculture county. Yeah, we are, we absolutely are an agriculture county, and we need to maintain that heritage, and it's something we need to push, and it's something that we can be proud of, and it's something that that is represented worldwide, literally worldwide. Um, you look at. Uh, you know, in, in the in the dairy industry, we've got we've got a big dairy in the county. We've got a couple of big dairies in the county uh, that that are that, that do a really good job. So when those dairies go to buy a go to buy alfalfa to feed their their cattle to feed that dairy cow, they're looking for a high nutrient value product right. to feed that dairy cow. Ours to, is high to, in iron to make to, <laughs> yeah to maximize her output, right? The thing that we do here in Iron County, because we are a high mountain desert, we have hot days and cool nights, we grow a very high quality alfalfa. Mm. And so back to another ad from California, happy cows oh, yeah. are in California, right? Yeah. Well, those happy cows are eating hay from Southern Utah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and, and maximizing their production, so. Well, Ken, tell people how they can find out more about your campaign and how they can send you checks and get signs and all of that good stuff. It's Robinson for Iron County. Robinson for Iron County. Yep. Is that .org, .com? .com. .com. Robinson for Iron County .com. We'll put that on the screen so people can find that and uh is there a means to contact you on there is there a phone number there is, is there my, email? my contact information is on there okay fantastic yeah robinson for and so the the process is going to go thusly on april 11th we have the republican or the gop um convention where the delegates will gather together and they will cast their votes for who the Republican nominee will be for uh, the various county offices. That's the county convention. And then later there will be a state convention for state offices, governor, and, and all of that. That'll happen at 23rd or something like that. I, I don't remember. But as far as your race is concerned, uh, that will be uh, coming up at the GOP convention on April 11th. 11th. Uh, I am a delegate uh, for Iron County in, in that. And uh, that's when you can come and hear the speeches and, and hear where everybody stands uh, who's running for county office. We have a lot of unopposed uh, candidates yeah. uh, in this, this go around. But, you know, the, the people that I see running. Uh, you got Karsten running unopposed, and he's done a great job. He's been a freaking amazing uh, in, in his office. So, um, and then uh, you both, both of the candidates, there, there were four candidates for, for seat C, and there were two five, of, five, five, three original. have dropped out. Correct. And so um, you both have, have put the option for uh, convention by acclamation or. Yes by gathering signatures and do you have all your signatures yet? I, I turn in my signatures okay quite a so while you ago. will be on the ballot I will I will be November. on the ballot and the reason I did this is so I could get out and meet people and introduce myself and sure. get my name out there where I'm not gonna have the name recognition yeah I, I've always hated the caucus system I think it disenfranchises an awful lot of people who yeah. have jobs and can't be there at a certain time and and I like the primary system but I'm, I'm not from here as people like to remind <laughs> me all the time I've been here 18 oh, 19 years now and uh, but I'm not from here um, but no I, I I think it's uh, it's good to have the option for people to, to be able to support you in different ways but the the uh, you should come out it's going to be at Cedar High on April 11th at 7 p.m. I hope I got that right or I'm gonna be in the wrong that's place Canyon View. or Canyon View I'm Canyon sorry View yeah High. Canyon View you're right Canyon View High that's what I had in my mind when I was seeing it but <laughs> um, at 7 p.m. on April 11th so you can come out and you can meet the candidates there will be meet and greet there they will all have their table set up they will each be giving speeches to let you know what they stand for and uh, we're looking forward to that and then after that we will have a, uh, a primary um, unless one of the candidates at the convention gets sixty percent of the votes, and then it's it's a sealed deal, right? It's they're they're not they're the nominee. They're they're the GOP nominee. GOP nominee. The other can be on the yeah. ballot. Okay, so the other can be on the ballot. So, um, and then 
We hope that you will come out. We will hear those candidates. We hope that you will share this podcast with your friends in Iron County so that they can know uh, what the issues are and who they uh, can look at to support. And uh, we appreciate you coming in. Thank and you. Spending some time with us. And uh, we uh, want to make a, a quick uh, self-serving post here. Um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff, and one of the things that w our mission is to support all first responders in Iron County. Uh, after the horrible killings of the Haight family, we were able to raise around $50,000, which we were able to use to purchase additional mental health care for members of the community and members of the first responder community um, in dealing with that tragedy. Well, we have another fundraiser going on right now, and we are starting off Operation Woof and Iron County is in desperate need of a, an explosives trained canine officer. Right now we have bomb, uh, we have drug sniffing dogs and tracking dogs and attack dogs, um, but we do not have our own explosives and firearms trained uh, canine. So anytime a bomb threat's called into a school or any kind of a, a explosives or firearms uh, incident happens, we have to wait for that resource from either the state or from a, an adjoining county. And that can create a long period of time and in which that time can create tragedy. So we are trying to raise enough money to bring that resource to our county. And if you go to friendsoficsheriff.org, you will see a big icon with a big bomb and a dog. And you can click on that and we would appreciate any donations that you can make to help us bring that resource to Iron County. I am Dan Kidder and this is the What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast in conjunction with Cedar City Politics. And we thank you for watching and we hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. We hope that you found this content to be worthwhile. We want to hear from you. So if you have any upcoming event that you'd like to share with our listeners, or if you represent a local group, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Just email us at contact at what's really happening su.com. We're also working on streaming this podcast live and have the ability for folks to call in and ask questions or share items of interest to residents of Southern Utah. Be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And again, thanks for listening.